you are welcome here. You are welcome. Good job, y'all. That was great. Hi, everybody. I'm Reverend Bonnie Rose. Great to see you here this morning at the Ventura Center for Spiritual Living. Thank you so much for joining us today. You know, um, we haven't done this since the pandemic, but I'm wondering if we can take just a moment to, to greet somebody. Um, ask somebody sitting near you, preferably somebody that you don't know, what brought you to church today? What brought you to church? I can ask you. Yeah, yeah. Have to be. All righty. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I know. All right, folks, here we are. Here we are. <laughs> This is a good sign. This is a good sign. Lots of laughter, lots of fun. And we are complete. Thank you. Now, I hope nobody took me literally when I said, um, you know, what brought you to church? Did you anybody say my car? Yes. Right? <laughs> there you go. Thought so. <laughs> All righty. Well, I'm glad you're here. And if those of you who are listening online, feel free to write down what brought you to church today, too, okay? What brought you in your pajamas to the TV screen so you could watch it? Okay. <laughs> Lonnie, take it away. Thank you, Bonnie. My pleasure. Let me see. Oh, here I am. You know, I love audience participation. That was great, you guys. I mean, we could have just stood here for hours listening. I mean, sure, they would have been talking. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. And those at home, just so you get the actual feeling of church, I want you to go out and move your car about 10 times, <laughs> park up the street, and then walk home and watch us. I know. Thank you for braving this interesting traffic mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. You made it before all the other people made it for the other events going on in Mentor, but you are here for this one. Yes. And I know it's going to be a lot of fun. I think it will. Yes. Welcome. Okay. Thank you for joining us. All right. Thank you, Lonnie. And now we're going to hear from our youth and family guy, Bill Hadras. So everyone gets settled in. Good morning. I'm Bill Hadris with Youth and Family. Oops. So to start out today, I invite everyone just to relax for a moment. Close your eyes if you'd like. Take a breath. And think about what have you done well lately? Maybe something you made progress on or even accomplished or an obstacle you overcame. Congratulations. Give yourself a pat on the back. Doesn't that feel good? So... Who thinks they are perfect when it comes to everything? Hmm? All right. Well, who thinks they can be okay at everything? Hmm? You know, the difference between perfectionism and being perfect is that in perfectionism, we are always working to strive for a standard that is outside of ourselves. When we are kind to ourselves and we remember that we are already perfect, we, we become willing to let God work through us to reveal that which is to be done by us. When we are humble or okay with who we are, it is always enough. So who liked that pat on the back? How are you going to earn another one? What new thing are you going to try to do? What new goal are you going to strive to meet? What's the next thing to accomplish? Going to clean the fish tank. And the bunny. 
what reward can you give yourself after you are successful? I invite you all to repeat after me. I am perfect when being okay. And so it is. So it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. You are the face of God. I hold you in my heart. You are a part of me. You are the face of God. You are the face of God. Okay, yay, thank you, thank you. See you guys, here you go, we'll see you later, have fun. <laughs> thank you practitioners and ministers for standing and everybody in this congregation as we join together in our perfect imperfection, absolutely knowing that prayer is the abundance of grace in all of our lives. Prayer is our conversation with God every day, every moment that we remember that connection and we speak to that connection. Knowing that as we gather here this beautiful Sunday morning in this beautiful sanctuary of kindness, that we are in store for a treat from Reverend Bonnie Rose with her message from God this morning. And as we hear this message, let us embrace it, bring it into our hearts and bring it into our lives. For when we leave this sanctuary, we, we take the message with us. It is part of who we are. It is all of our consciousness in life to live the word, to be the word, to speak the word, and to embrace the word. And thank you, Reverend Bonnie, for being here every Sunday to deliver God's message to us and for us. And in, in this beautiful space of kindness, of love, I am so thankful for being here, for knowing the power of prayer, for knowing the beauty of prayer, and for knowing the heart of God within myself. In this attitude of gratitude, please join me as we release this prayer into the universal law, and together we say, and so it and is. so it is. Thank you, Reverend Karen. Let us breathe deeply and continue to anchor into that beautiful space, that space of knowing and that space of goodness that is always within us, that place of spiritual perfection which is inclusive of all things, seen and unseen. And let us breathe together as we open our hearts to listen to the words of our sacred reading. The Sound of Wings, an excerpt from Dances with Dogs by Reverend Bonnie Rose. A friend and I often greet each other with the Arabic words ishkalah, Ishq is passionate love for God, crazy love for spirit in matter and matter in spirit. The Sufi dervish wonder that whirls and says, Ishkala mabud lela, God is love, lover, and beloved. Our dogs, Sarah and Barty, hike with me in the mountains where Sarah brings a special brand of Ishq. Whenever she senses a bird, she freezes in a perfect point. Time stops as she leans forward, her front leg bent, her stubby tail extended. It's dog yoga, downward pointing dog as she claims union with her ordained purpose. I hold my breath. The earth holds its breath. Then Sarah hears a sacred starting gun, discernible only in dog land. She barrels into the underbrush. Twenty gray quail fling themselves up out of the bushes. No chirping, only the sound of insistent wings that say, I am. I inhale the sound of the wings and say, so am I, beloved quail, I am. 
Sarah barks at the quail, then races back down the mountain to share her excitement with Barty and me. You are the beloved two sweet dogs, I say. Together we continue our each intoxicated hike. What did I do to deserve this microcosm of audacious grace? Who created a dog that points so clearly and dearly? What offers a flock of quail the adventure of a shared getaway? How do air, feathers, and flight conspire to break one's heart into beauty with sounds only love can hear? Who submits us to this drunken recklessness? Ishkala Mabud Lala, God as love, lover, and beloved. What a privilege it is to listen to the three in one. No definitions, no reasoning required. Simply wonder in the wordless wings. Love, lover, and beloved sing to us constantly, but will we listen? Will we hear? With love's help, I'll try and listen better. I'll start with the high school band that rehearses every day inches from my house. I'll fall in love with the raucous on Wisconsin. I'll shimmy to the salsa version of Beethoven's Fur Elise. I'll dance to the drum line. I'll trust love to transform out of tone, out of tune band music to the sound of teenagers pointing their clarinets and saxophones towards the intangible angle of grace. I'll know the music hasn't changed. The beloved changes me. The lever tempt, tempts my ears to hear differently. And the alchemy of love transforms annoyance into amazement. With practice, we can learn everything is love, lover and beloved. Dissonance and grace, the New York Philharmonic and the Santa Paula High School Band. It's all the sound of wings. It's all Ishkalam Abud Lela. Everything is intoxicated rapture calling us home. Home to heaven on earth, precisely where we belong. And so here we are in the sacred sanctuary home in heaven on earth, precisely where we belong knowing that heaven on earth is always with us and we open our eyes and our hearts and our ears and our beings to receive it, to know it and to trust it as the truth of existence. And so one way that we remember that is by singing, by singing, I am remembering who I am, knowing that I am is another word for the divine, for God, for love, for ishq, whatever it is to us, we know that it is beautiful and it is great and it is grace, and it is abundant. So in the spirit of that abundant grace, let us sing together, I am remembering who I am. And as we sing it for ourselves, we sing it for all beings everywhere. For everything is the I am presence. I am remembering who I am. Together we remember the divine grace that infuses everything. And let us breathe in deeply. And then exhale, opening our eyes as love, in love and in service to what is, as it is, and so it is.
fruta, la torta, la torta, abundanza, 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 In case you hadn't noticed, it's not your normal church here, okay? <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> I do have a question, and this might be better for after the service, but did you do the slides? Oh, you did the slides. So why was there a pig race at the end? <laughs> did you see? Andiamo, let's go. I got you. And they, were, they wanted to eat, so they were pigs, okay? <laughs> no, no, I, we were Excited to go. Yeah, okay, good, just good to know. I just like pigs, so I was excited to see them. I was excited, okay. Anyway, what can you say after that, right? So, <laughs> seems to be a food theme here. That the, um, the service today, is, the sermon today is called Abundance of Grace, and that's actually a picture of my little nephew, uh, great nephew, who got his first birthday cake. It was his first birthday cake. And <laughs> you can't see the whole picture, but it's really all over him. It's hanging off of his toes and everything. And <laughs> I was watching a little video of him getting it, and he was just like, what is this? <laughs> What has happened? It was right in front of him, and, and um, he was about to start eating it. And I heard my nephew, who studies brain science, off from the side. He goes, baby's first oxytocin, oxytocin hit. <laughs> so he seems to have enjoyed it. <laughs> and there he is. But truly, an abundance of grace is around us all of the time. And that's what we're exploring today. Where did we learn about grace? I think some of us might have had sort of a faulty vision of what grace really is. And I, cl I included this verse from the, from the Christian Bible, from the letters of Paul, that is sometimes interpreted in sort of a funny way. But I wanted to in, uh, bring it to, to mind because some of us read this verse, perhaps, or heard this verse and thought of grace in a, in a slightly different way than the way we teach it here. Some of you may know this, but the verse says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Okay? Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I was growing up and I heard that, and I, I actually resonate very deeply with, with Christianity, but when I heard that, I did have a few questions. I wondered, is my faith going to be good enough? Like, I'll only be saved if my faith is good enough. And then I would also wonder, can we earn grace? Do we have to earn grace? Is grace that something that is, that is earned by me being good enough, by me having enough faith? And then I would also wonder, what is salvation? And then after that, of course, one's mind goes to, what is the opposite of salvation? <laughs> 
<laughs> it's a golden retriever wearing a devil costume, okay? <laughs> I'm in, no. Anyway. <laughs> So I think those and other questions might have been might have resonated through our minds as we as we uh, looked at this con concept called grace that is actually quite our human minds are limited to in terms of really understanding what grace is it's beyond our comprehension it's so so beautiful and so paradoxical it's it's almost too beautiful to behold so a little bit more about that a little bit of understanding of why we sometimes perceive grace as the way, the way that we do is that our ego likes to sort. For the last, I don't know, year or so, I've been talking about the binary operating system and that our brains are binary, and our brains feel more secure if they can sort things, if they can say, this is, this is good, right? Or this, this is evil. <laughs> And, you know, when I, I think in, in the, the book that I wrote, I was talking about one day during COVID, I, it was during the pandemic when there were so many unanswered questions, just a million unanswered questions. And we didn't know what we were doing at the church. We didn't know what we were supposed to do. The government was saying this. People in the congregation were saying that. Other ministers were saying this. We, did, we didn't know what to do. And I went over to the Goodwill to donate some clothes because I had extra time and I cleaned out my closet. I went over to the Goodwill to donate some things. And the guy said to me, you know, you're going to have to put those things in the boxes by yourself. We can't sort them for you. I was so excited. <laughs> I get to sort. I know what to do. I know that the shoes go in this bin, and the books go in this bin, and the toys go in this bin. It was thrilling. <laughs> the ego likes to sort. The ego also likes to transact. The ego likes to say, if I do this, then I receive this. It's kind of like earning, right? If I do this, then I will earn that particular reward. We do that much of the time, unconsciously. And then the thing about grace, though, is that it's an unearned, unconditional oneness that doesn't have much to do with sorting. It doesn't have much to do with transaction. Grace is unearned, unconditional oneness, and its only condition is that we receive it. That we receive it. Do you know anything else like that? The only condition is to receive it. No? Okay. <laughs> there might be. I don't know. I don't know. Love. Yeah, love. Yeah, love. The only condition of love, pure love, is that we receive it, right? A little bit about mystical grace and how we teach it in this denomination. Ernest Holmes, our founder, there he is, he's right in front. <laughs> he's, you see how the choir backed up for the, I mean, the, uh, the flat choir backed up to make room for the, for the three-dimensional choir? That's pretty cool. They look very excited, don't you think? <laughs> they all crowded in that space. <laughs> Ernest Holmes said that mystical grace is the eternal givingness of spirit, the giving that never stops giving. Think of the word eternal, the eternal and I would also add infinite giving this of spirit, right? I would also say that grace is the awareness of the absolute, awareness of absolute reality. Absolute reality is that place where Rumi's field, where there, is, uh, there are ideas of right doing and wrong doing, but it's beyond that. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full. The fullness of the world is too full to talk about. It's awareness of the absolute also is awareness of who we are. I shared this in the classes I was teaching this week about how when you consider a baby, does anybody here know a baby or has anybody here known a baby, right? When you consider a baby, they just kind of sit there, particularly when they're young and they haven't really learned anything yet and they haven't really put labels on anything yet. They don't have any context. They don't look at their little chubby thighs and go, oh my God, I need to reduce that, don't I? Right? <laughs> They just are experiencing. And another way to cultivate awareness of the absolute is to, is to practice getting in touch with that thing within us that is absolute reality. It is the experiencer. It is awareness. It is consciousness. Again, the practice I did with my class, we can all do it here. Think a thought. Think, what do you think about the flat choir? Just, you don't have to say it out loud. Just think a thought. Okay. And then, what are you planning on having for lunch today? <laughs> Somebody's very excited about his lunch over there. <laughs> what are you going to do if the traffic is bad? What's your favorite television show? Think, 
about all those things, and all of those thoughts keep changing. All of those thoughts are objects, but the eternal subject is that which observes all those thoughts, that which knows you are thinking, that which experiences all of those thoughts. Now, again, it's, it's a little conceptual, and it's, it can be hard to imagine, but that's who we are. We, we are the eternal experiencer, and the eternal experiencer is like grace. It takes whatever you give it, and it receives it. So awareness of the absolute is also a, an aspect of mystical grace. And then from the reading that Hugh did, Love, Lover, and, and Beloved, Ishkala, Mabud, Lila, Love, Lover, and Beloved. Grace is all of those things working in a holy trinity, in a holy trinity of oneness. And at some point, it becomes unclear as to who is love, who is lover, and who is beloved. I put up the dervish there, there because it's, a, it's from a Sufi teacher. And the, you know, when you think about the dervish, OK, the dervish is spinning. But what is spinning the dervish? That's what I'm talking about. It's that kind of mysticism that is kind of beyond words, but it's something that touches us as we touch it, something that receives us as we receive it. We touch the hem of the garment of the infinite absolute grace, and our lives change from the inside out. Back to that Bible verse. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And the way that I might translate that Bible verse, a new interpretation, is that grace is omnipresent good, freely offered. It saves us, part about salvation, it saves us from the illusion of separation. We don't have to earn it. Grace naturally fills us with both awe and humility. Our humility is our true power. And because humility and power are sort of paradoxical words in our binary brain, it must be true. If it's a paradox, it must be true. So that's a new interpretation. Grace is freely given. It is freely given unto us so that we may receive it, so that we may, may receive all of the gifts of the kingdom, all of the gifts of the realm of heaven, all of the gifts of God, all of the gifts of this amazing life that has been given to us. We are here to receive the fullness of creation. That's a quote from Charles Eisenstein. I was watching a, uh, a video by him last night. I was preparing for something I had to do this morning, and I was watching Charles Eisenstein speak, and he was talking about how birds sing. How many of you, I know I do this, sometimes I just will wake up out of a frenzy of thought or worry, and I'll say, oh my goodness, the birds are singing, and I didn't even notice, right? And Charles Eisenstein was saying that the birds sing. There is an adaptive reason that they sing, and an evolutionary reason. They sing to attract a mate, right? How many of you have ever sung to attract a mate? I have. No. <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Our choir director. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So they sing to attract a mate, but he said, you know, they don't really probably have to sing as much as they do. They sing extra, and that's just a gift to all of us. But again, it's like grace. We have to stop, and we have to listen to it, and we have to hear it, and we have to take it in and appreciate it. Then it really becomes grace. It already is grace, but we experience it as grace as we take it in and we listen to it, as we receive it and perceive it. Another quote. I liked this one a lot. This one spoke to me. Grace is exactly what's happening, minus our opinion of it. <laughs> That's from a Zen teacher, Charlotte Joko Beck. I'm going to read that again. Grace is exactly what's happening, minus our opinion of it. Now, if this were a class, I would ask you, to turn to your neighbor and talk about this and get a little insight. But that'll take too long. We're going <laughs> to. I think that probably a lot of us are very opinionated about what is happening, right? And sometimes, sometimes that opinion or judgment can get in the way of the full experience of grace. I'll explain more about that later with an example. But now I just want to do a little bit more with that. Are we possibly keeping grace out through our judgment? 
Is it possible that the only thing standing in the way of our experience of grace is our judgment? Grace is there, but is the thing that's getting in the way of our receiving of it our judgment? Judgment is often a misunderstood term in spiritual circles. Some people think they shouldn't judge anything, but we do need some judgment, right? We need some discernment. Some of us need to know um, discernment so that we can drive well. I haven't quite mastered that yet, but, you know, we do have to know what country we're in and what side of the road to drive on, and we need to all kind of obey the, the, uh, the laws of the, of the road so we discern, right? We discern, like, if there's something going on with our body, it's helpful to discern that something feels a little bit off. But judgment is really something more. It's condemnation. And when I read that Bible verse before, I was hearing a little bit of condemnation in that. Now, I don't know whether that was God or St. Paul or whatever, but I was hearing a little condemnation, like God is not going to save me unless I believe, unless I have faith in a perfect way, in the way that God wants me to have faith. Am I the only one? Did anybody else hear, that, hear it that way when, I was, when they were a kid? Okay. Well, I guess I'm not hardly anybody rose their hands, so I guess, okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So it can be condemnation, divine condemnation from, the divine, from God or whatever. It can be condemnation of others. It can be condemnation of the self. It, be, it can become condemnation of what is going on in your life, condemning this and saying, this is wrong, this shouldn't be happening. Yeah, some things are wrong and they shouldn't be happening, but they are happening. And is there, is there a way that we can soften our gaze and perhaps see a bigger picture around that and receive the grace and the gift that that situation might have to offer us. And then there's our friend's attachment and clinging. <laughs> that often gets in the way of the experience of grace. I need reality to be like this. Or in relationships, I need you to be like this or else I won't be happy. In... Oh, and everything, and in life itself, in politics, I need this side to shape up so that this side will, will, will do the right thing, or whatever. I may have said that wrong. But anyway, <laughs> but clinging to the way that we think it should be, attachment to the way that we think it should be, attachment and clinging to the way that we think we should be. I should be a better person. I should be less judgmental. <laughs> Oh, I had a therapist once that was, he said the wisest thing to me. He said many wise things to me, but one of the things he said, I was struggling. I was in ministerial school at the time, and I told him I felt that I was judging my colleagues. Any of the other ministerial students here ever <laughs> judge their colleagues? This is Reverend Susan Burrell's looking over her shoulder. She's trying to find Karen Mondragon to see if she did it, right? <laughs> I felt that I was judging my colleagues, being too judgmental. And all he did is he said, well, you know what? You'll probably just hang on to that judgment as long as you need it. Then you won't need it anymore. I was like, oh, wow. And something in that just released me from judging myself from judging. And then it went away. Not completely, <laughs> but it went away for the most part. So we're putting all kinds of pressure on ourself and on reality and on everything to be a certain way so that we can be okay. And we are far more unconditional than that. Our happiness, our joy is not dependent upon circumstances. Oh, and then there's one last thing. And again, this just points out how sweet and dear our little human brains are. You know, we want to sort. I told you that story about the pandemic. There's something so delightful about sorting. Who here likes a to-do list? Oh. Okay, I see a lot of hands about that, right? Who here likes an Excel spreadsheet? Oh. You know, you put it on a spreadsheet and it might happen. It's really, it's a beautiful thing. We like to sort. But I wanted to look at some of the nuances of sorting. We're often sorting about the future. Again, we're saying, if this thing happens in the future, it will ruin me. Right? We're saying this is bad in the future, whereas if this happened, that would be good, but probably this bad thing's going to happen. We're predicting the future and often in a negative way. We're also sorting the past. We're reliving past guilts, saying, replaying last guilt, saying, you know, this thing that I did was really bad. We're sorting it into the bad category when really, if we look at something that we've done in the past, again, there might have been a gift in it that we're not aware of until we soften our gaze. We confuse our personal story with reality. I was on a call this morning before I, before I came to church, and somebody said uh, one of her tools for working with this concept was to write down what happened, just write down the facts like she was 
I was going to say a news reporter, but <laughs> the news is not always so factual right now. It's kind of laden with opinion. But just write down the facts, OK? Write down the facts, and then write down how you felt, and then write down your story about it. Look at the story about it. Look at the feeling. And then just go back to the facts and see if there's a new story. It doesn't even have to be your story, but just imagine a new story that could go with those facts. That's one way. One way to, uh, we're still sorting, but to sort anew, and one way to receive a greater experience of grace, or at least know that we live in this absolute reality that is both infinite and intimate. To live in this reality that contains all possibilities. And again, we categorize ourselves. We say, I'm this kind of person. I could never do that. We categorize the other. This person is difficult. This person is, um, you know, whatever, whatever you want to say. And we categorize life. This situation is not for me. This situation is against me. This other person is against me. We categorize constantly. It's just the way our brains work. And we're not bad for doing it. But it is something that we can look at. It's something that we can, we can soften and something that we can, we can work with in a new way. OK? So yes, is there an alternative? The answer is yes. <laughs> One is to relax. Just relax. If we relax our bodies, then we can think about relaxing our stories a bit. We don't have to cling to the stories. Imagine the story that you're telling yourself about life, particularly if it's a negative story that you're, that you're clinging to. And just imagine that your hands are clinging to it. And just imagine how white your knuckles are. And just relax it just a little bit, just a little bit, to let that story go. To let that story go and just allow it to be. You don't have to change it. Just relax it and let it go. You can always, we can always pick it up again if we want to. But just for a minute, just relax it. And if you can't relax your story, notice how much you want to cling to it and then relax that. Notice your desire to cling, and then relax that. Your story is only a thought combination. It's a thought. It's a bunch of thoughts that are all similar. It's the thoughts that you don't want to think, but we're thinking them over and over and over and over again, creating neural grooves in our brain. It's a thought combination that we don't want to think, but for some reason, we repeat them over and over again because we think they're helping us. You think, if I just worry about this long enough, then it will fix it. It doesn't work that way. We have to change our thought. But part of changing our thought is recognizing that our story is just a thought. It's a series of thoughts. And a, th and a thought can be changed. A thought can be changed. A thought is not engraved in cement. A thought can be changed. <laughs> and then this is what I like to call the Bernie Austin principle. <laughs> Bernie says, I am not the boss of the universe. <laughs> That's because Lonnie is, no. <laughs> no. None of us is the boss of the universe. And oh my goodness, in, in, in writing a memoir, I really recommend that you all write a memoir. I'll read it if you do. Alicia and I may actually teach a class about that next year. If we, if we took a class on writing memoir essays, would anybody take it? Yeah, some people, okay, good, good to know. Because it's so revealing. You write stuff about the past, and then you see how that was, when you're writing about what's happening now, you see how that thing that happened in the past was absolutely perfect for setting up what needs to happen later. We are not the boss of the universe, and there is a greater force, a greater power, a greater grace that is assembling all of these pieces of this jigsaw puzzle to make a perfectly divine picture of who we truly are meant to be. So you have Bernie to thank for that. I am not the boss of the universe. When you see Bernie during the social hour, please go up to her and say, you are not the boss of the universe, OK? <laughs> that will help her, OK? <laughs> All right. So part of grace, then, is detaching from outcome. Now, the question that I often get when we talk about detaching from outcome, does this mean that we don't care what happens? You know, there's a famous Krishnamurti story where he's speaking to a bunch of his people, his disciples, or whatever you want to call them, and um, they, they ask him, you know, how, how is it that you're enlightened? What is the meaning of life? What, what is it that works so well for you? And Krishnamurti says, I don't mind what happens. He doesn't say he doesn't care what happens. He says, I don't mind what happens, which I think is kind of a double entendre in that he doesn't... 
he doesn't slap whatever happens with his mind and impose a bunch of worry and a bunch of projection and a bunch of, a bunch of stuff that he doesn't need on what happens. He just takes it in and he allows it to let go. And he can still care what happens, but he doesn't have to clench what happens with the, this huge, it's not really a muscle, but this huge muscle of a mind, right? So we care, but we don't mind what happens. Okay, we do care. What we're doing when we stop clamping down on our clinging, when we start detaching, is that we start making room for an infinite outcome. We start making room for possibilities that are beyond our imagination. We start making rooms for something that spirit has ordained years and years and years and years and years before we came into existence. Spirit has ordained some seeds or is growing seeds that our ancestors planted seven generations back. We are planting seeds right now that will, that will move seven or more generations forward. We are making room for an infinite outcome. I don't remember who wrote this book, but there is a book that says when we play a game, as in the game of life, we don't play to win, because when you have that kind of game, you have a winner and a loser. We are playing for an infinite outcome, meaning that we embrace the infinite in every single step in the way. And what that means is that we create a bigger playground for good. If we're clamping down on the way that we think it needs to be, if we're clamping down on our own opinion of what reality is, or our own opinion of who we are, or our own opinion of what this other person is, then we are limiting God's playground, good's playground. You ever seen, I don't think they do this anymore in, in crime scenes, but um, back, in the, back in the day when I used to watch crime shows, they would draw like a chalk outline around a body, right? I always think about that when I feel like I'm limiting God, like I've drawn a chalk outline about my concept and it can't get any bigger unless I erase the chalk outline. So think for a minute about where you might be limiting good. It's really, you know, anything that comes up that distresses us, anything that doesn't feel good to us is such a great portal for doing this work, for saying, okay, okay, there's a limitation here, and I don't think it's life. I think I must be clinging to something. I must be clinging to a certain outcome. I must be insisting that the universe do things my way. What if I could just relax? I can still want things to be my way, but what if I could just relax and just make a little smidgen, just a little room for something greater to come in? Maybe there's a greater outcome and I'm just not aware of it yet. Just opening up to that possibility makes a huge difference in the way that spirit can show up in our lives. Some practices, these are gonna be pretty quick. You know all of these practices. We all know all of these practices, I think. But I think the question is, do we do them? <laughs> Many of us have, say, done meditation for a day or so, <laughs> or practiced forgiveness for maybe a week, or even like changed our eating habits, and there's this thing of like, you know, when I eat well, I actually feel pretty good, right? It's the same thing with these practices. If we actually do them, we feel much better. <laughs> By the way, some practices when grace gets stuck, I think it was about 20 years ago this weekend that I stood on the beach with my dog and I found out that this church existed. And I talked to a woman that attended here and uh, I had, had no intention of being a minister. When she walked away, I turned to my dog and I said, hey, if that church opens up, maybe I'll apply for the job. <laughs> and then two weeks later, the minister resigned and I was like, oh. <laughs> What was I thinking? But my audition sermon was called When Grace Gets Stuck. <laughs> yeah. I will do it again sometime. It's a, it got, I guess it got me the job, right, Karen? So I guess it was okay. All right. So anyway, some practices. Mindfulness. Look within first. Rather than stressing about how the external world is, is, is messing with you, Look for the inner Velcro. Why is this sticking to me so badly? What is my thought about this? And is there a new thought that I can have about it? Forgiveness. 
forgiving ourselves. All forgiveness is self-forgiveness. So forgiving ourselves first for reacting, kind of like when my therapist said, you know, just, just keep the judgment until you don't need it anymore. Forgiveness opens doors. And then there's forgiveness of the other, but really all forgiveness is self-forgiveness. So f start with self-forgiveness. Start with self-forgiveness. The other thing is then identifying with awareness. When I had you do that exercise where you all thought of different thoughts, what you're having for dinner, how you feel about the traffic, what's your, what movie you, is your favorite movie, the, th the thing that is having all of those experiencing, all of those experiences that is experiencing those thoughts, that experiencer is who you really are. That stays the same. That doesn't change. The experiencer itself, the thought changes, but that which is experiencing, that awareness of the thought is who we really are. So see if we can identify with that just by letting go and say, you know, there's something underneath this thought that is working my nerves. There's something here that is deeper than that. Let me identify with that. And we often find it in the breath and the body, lately particularly in the gut for me and also the heart. Another thing is giving, giving something away, giving an act of kindness, giving what you wish to receive, giving something away, giving, giving a compliment, giving listening. Listening is a huge thing, just, just committing to listening one day. Listening to ourselves, listening to others, listening to the inner voice with compassion and understanding. In the reading, I talked about how in the high school band was playing, how I used to be, I didn't go into detail, but I used to get so annoyed at them because they're, I mean, they really are very close to our house. And, and I would be so annoyed. And then just through a process of letting go, I just started to realize, wait a minute, these are teenagers. These are teenagers playing instruments, just like I used to do when I was a teenager. And they could be doing other things. They could be doing whatever teenagers do when they're acting up these days. I don't, I don't know. I'm not familiar with that these, anymore. But, but, well, I knew what I used to do. But anyway, that's, <laughs> that's a whole other sermon. But, you know, they're playing instruments. They're, they're joining in community to make music. That's amazing. And I think about other things, too, that we can turn, that, that seem annoying, that we can turn into amazement. You know, often when I talk about what annoys you, many, many people say traffic, right? <laughs> Anybody here annoyed by traffic or uh, drivers and whatnot? Yeah, oh, proud, proud, annoyed person at traffic sitting in the back, okay. <laughs> yeah. We can certainly look at all the annoying people on the road, right? The people that seem to annoy us, but when you really stop and think about it, there's a lot of cooperation going on there. Merging onto the freeway, how does that happen? How does that happen? Four-way stop signs. In Beverly Hill, there's a five-way stop sign, and we're all like, e -e 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 -e. but we all, we all work it out. There is an amazing amount of cooperation and grace going on in traffic. So turning our annoyance into amazement, turning our annoyance about traffic into the fact that we're in a car, that's amazing. And we're probably listening to music or a podcast. That's amazing, people. That's amazing. Say it with me. That's amazing. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and just recognizing that grace is infinite. You can't outgive grace. Grace is also intimate in that there are unique ways that grace is going to express through you. And then there's supposed to be a comma after intimate. You don't need to fix the slide, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> infinite, intimate, and then there are other ways, other ways to, um, to practice the capacity to receive grace. And because it is intimate, you'll find your own way. You could, you know, if, you, if you're willing, you could meditate, just getting in touch with that awareness, that place underneath all thought, underneath all feelings, underneath all conditions, and just say, divine love, teach me how to experience grace today. Show me the way. And if we ask and we remain open, we will be shown a way to experience a deeper expression of grace. <laughs> that has become my favorite headshot. I wish, I wish I could use that for more things. It's me with a dog cone on my head. And <laughs> this is my own personal experience of, of experiencing grace. So this is the, probably the last week I'm talking about this book that I wrote. And, you know, I was just thinking back about before it was published, how afraid I was to put all these words out there. It's quite an intimate story. And, um, and I had a lot of fear about it, fear that I would be judged, uh, fear that I would be excommunicated from the movement. <laughs> but actually, they don't really know about it yet, so don't tell anybody, okay? <laughs> 
fear that people in the congregation would have hurt feelings, you know, just all kinds of fears, fears that my family would have hurt feelings, you know, just every, everybody that I included, I just felt this great potential to, to uh, be criticized for it. And, you know, I actually was a little bit, and even that was grace, because we were able to work it out in a way that was, I, I cultivated my compassion and understanding, and so did the other person. But there was a whole concept of uh-oh and predicting the future, sorting the present into the future, putting my mind into the future of what could go wrong when I released this book. And then gradually, I came up with the idea that success is service. You know, you have the idea, I made a book, I need to sell X number of copies to make it uh, you know, profitable, feasible to cover my expenses. But maybe that's not really what success is. Maybe success is service. How can this book serve? How can I serve? And what I found out through changing that inner thought through grace was that I was called, I am called now, to trust in an infinite game. And that infinite game is showing up in all kinds of miraculous ways of service. I shared this with a congregant the other day, a couple of congregants. I brought it to a, a bookstore that said they would carry it. And I went in there, and when I bring a book to a bookstore or to somebody sort of outside of the realm of the church, I always bring them heart pins from India. So I brought them little heart pins and with, with some cards. And it was a beautiful bookstore, and I was just, I, I gave it to the proprietor. And I was watching, just looking at books and seeing if I might buy something for myself. And every single person who came up to the counter asked about the heart pins. And it just gave me an opportunity to come to the front and tell the story of the women in India who make the heart pins. And that's a story where women were empowered to get out of poverty, to get out of poverty and to start sewing and distributing these pins for a gift economy basis, like there's no set fee, people just pay something or they pay nothing or they do acts of kindness but it changed their lives, and these pins circulate all around the world. So the pins get to tell a story all around the world, and then those of us who know and love the heart pin women, we get to recount those stories and tell it back to them. These women that live in the slums that may not realize that they have a global impact, they do have a global impact. I shared the story with two of the people that work with them, and they said the women were so excited to hear that their pins were in a, were in a, in a bookstore, opening the hearts of people in Southern California. I think a great idea for our center to do someday is to have an impact story about the heart pins, like do a video and we'll send it to India, right? So you see how this is infinite? There are so many possibilities. And then I shared the heart pin story with somebody at the church last Sunday, and she said, well, you know what? I gave a heart pin at my mechanic's office. <laughs> and it was not the mechanic himself, but it was the person who was doing the billing. And she gave the heart pin to the person who was doing the billing. And the person said, you have no idea how much I needed this today. Her family was sick. She was struggling. You have no idea how much I needed this today. So you see how much greater that is than how many books did I sell? I'm so excited to get to play this infinite game now. And it makes everything so much easier. And if the, the denomination excommunicates me, well, it's been nice knowing you. <laughs> OK. Grace, trust, act, and count the ripples. Grace equals trusting and acting and counting the ripples. So for all of us here today, we ask ourselves, where do I experience an absence of grace? What is the story I tell myself about it? Is that story absolutely true, meaning an absolute reality, and in the infinite reality of all possibilities? Is that story true, or is it just a little tiny picture of, that I'm holding? What is the one thing I can do today to open a greater portal for infinite grace? These slides are available on our Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel, so you can check them out later if you didn't get all this. And then let us affirm together. Here we go. Grace is all around me. I believe in grace. I receive in grace. I practice grace. I am grace. And it shows. And so it is. Love you all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
All righty, we're running just a tad over. That's me. So I'm going to do a short prayer. Here we go. Let's pray. God is all there is. We are one with God. <laughs> and today we realize and we recognize that God is just this power and this beauty that moves through us, that transforms us. We recognize that God is omnipresent. And we realize that omnipresence, that grace that is the divine itself, we realize that in our lives. And so we invite the divine into our consciousness to show us the way of grace, to show us where we may be holding grace back at arm's length and just to soften our arms and our gaze and our bodies and our hearts and our guts and our minds to just allow that beautiful grace to enter us and to fill us with its worth and its beauty because we know it's there. We know it's there. We know it is there for us. And so we open today to receive it and we receive it so that we can spread it around in this infinite game called life, trusting grace, acting upon grace, and counting and trusting and believing in all the ripples that will ripple for generations. And so I'm so grateful, so grateful to know the spiritual truth, so grateful for the beautiful opportunity to get to share it, and so grateful for the divine love that is God, that is grace showing up in every one of us. I bless the spiritual teaching as I bless all paths to God, churches, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, gurdwaras, fundamentalists, atheists, agnostics, all paths everywhere. And with a heart so filled with blessedness, I say thank you, spirit. Thank you, love. And I release these words into the divine mystery. And together we say, and so it is. Thank you. So I turn within to trust and know that divine love is here right now and has guided us through this entire service. How beautiful it is to be so anchored here in love in this beautiful community. We give thanks for everyone that said yes to coming here today, to be part of this spiritual concoction that we're forming here, to be a blessing not only to ourselves individually and collectively, but a blessing to the whole cosmos. 
And so we give thanks for this time together. We give thanks for our individual and collective growth. We give thanks for love itself. With a heart that is so filled with gratitude, I say thank you, Spirit. Thank you, love. And I release these words into the divine mystery. And together we say, and so it is. Namaste.